All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, just a bit of housekeeping at the start. If you can all go on mute um, while you're not speaking, if you want to ask a question later, you can unmute yourself, but it does create a lot of background noise. So if everyone can put themselves on, on mute um, from the outset, that'd be great. Um, look, uh, welcome. Um, we're really delighted to have um, Pro Associate Professor Bart Onikowski join us all the way uh, from New York, New York University in uh, central New York there. Um, his work uh, applies insights from co cultural sociology to the study of politics in the United States and Europe. Um, so he's done a lot um, in both contexts with a particular focus on nationalism, uh, populism and the, the rise of the radical right. And he's published a whole slew of very um, high impact um, uh, articles that have just been fantastic. Um, and I see that he's now sort of pulling together um, those articles into a monograph, um, which is called Radicalized, uh, how the right has mobilized nationalism and undermined liberal democracy. Um, which I believe is under contract with Princeton University Press. So look out for that. Um, perhaps Bart can update us perhaps next year, um, fairly soon, I, th I think that'll be on the front. Someone isn't on mute. That might be Andrew Vandenberg, who's a serial um, non-muter. Andrew, if you're listening, can you can you go on mute? There we go. Um, I did it, yeah. You can mute him from your end, by the way. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. I, I haven't fully grasped all the mechanics of Zoom. Um, which I should have by now, having done so many of them. Um, so, and we were, we were, uh, we just missed out on having Bart join us in person for our conference on um, populism and democracy that we hosted with the Alfred Deakin Institute uh, at the end of last year, and unfortunately he was unable to make it in the end. Uh, but we're we're delighted that he's able to join us uh, via Zoom for this talk today. He'll have about sort of 30 minutes or so to talk uh, and then we'll open it up uh, to Q&A and, uh, and we'll, we'll take it from there. So it's over to you, Bart. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Ben. I really appreciate the invitation. It's wonderful to be there with you virtually and to see all of you, many of whom I, I already know, certainly your work I know and others I'm, I look forward to meeting in the Q&A in a little more uh, uh, depth. Uh, so yeah, as, as Ben was saying, I had really hoped to come last year in person. And then when that didn't work out, I had hope, I hoped to uh, come in person this year, but then COVID unfortunately got in the way. So perhaps there'll be other opportunities. Um, it's terrific to be with you over Zoom nonetheless. Uh, the title of today's talk is Populism, Nationalism and Racial Politics in the United States. It, in some ways, I mean, the title is very much reflective of what I'll be talking about, but it's both a little too narrow and too broad at the same time. Uh, it's too narrow in the sense that the, the, the phenomena I'll be talking about, the mechanisms I'll be identifying, really are intended to apply across cases, not just the United States, but also at the very least to Eastern and Western Europe, but perhaps beyond. Uh, so that's the narrow part. Too broad is, you know, I simply cannot tell you everything that I can think of or that one should say about populist nationalism and racial politics, certainly in the United States in the next uh, half an hour or, uh, or so. So I'll just be really talking about um, my book project and a specific empirical part of that book project, uh, trying to understand how to think about the rise of radical right politics um, across um, uh, contemporary liberal democracies with a specific focus on the US case today. Um, so, uh, Hopefully all of you can see this. So, you know, if, if any of you are paying attention to Europe, as I, meant, I imagine most of you are, then you've been seeing for a long time now the rise of radical right actors uh, in European politics, radical right parties, radical right candidates, uh, in some cases, new parties, in some cases, old parties that have been retooled for new purposes, and yet in other cases, old parties that have been captured by radical right actors. Um, and this cast of characters that I'm showing you keeps growing. Uh, it's, uh, we see new entrants all the time. Uh, of course, this phenomenon is not only limited to Europe. So in the United States, we have our own homegrown radical right um, actor, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, we're at a very particularly important moment this week, uh, really next week. So I'm happy to talk about that political moment uh, more, more in the Q&A. Uh, but the rise of all of these polit politicians and, and the parties they represent uh, really, uh, in my view, raises three puzzles. Um, the first puzzle is what is the radical right? And a lot has been written on this. I'll give you my, my brief take and, and a, some, somewhat of, a, of an intervention into this debate. Um, the second, why has it been surging? Which is really will be the, the bulk of what I'll talk about today. Uh, and finally, what are its consequences? And I'll just very briefly touch on this uh, and we can certainly talk about it more in the Q&A. 
Um, so the first question, what is the radical right, is, is I pose it because we have to know what it is that we're studying. And the, and the label radical right is far from perfect. It has a lot of problems conceptually, uh, but so do many of the other labels that we tend to use for the cast of characters I just showed you. Um, I really want to make four claims of, uh, uh, in a study that I'll present to you today. First, that nationalism, nationalism more than populism, uh, is essential for understanding the rise of radical right politics. Uh, populism and authoritarianism, the other two elements of this form of politics are also important, but we tend to underplay the centrality of nationalist claims and beliefs in understanding this form of politics. Second, that nationalist cleavages around competing understandings of the nation, of what America means, have long been latent in US political culture. Um, and interestingly enough, they haven't really changed that much in their distribution. And however, I, I want to argue the same cleavages, these cleavages around the meaning of the nation have recently become much more um, mobilizable. They become manifest, they become politically salient, and they've become important motivations in people's political choices. Um, and that's due for, you know, there are a variety of reasons for this. Um, the one specific uh, factor I wanna home, home in on today is the, the sorting of nationalist beliefs across the two major parties in the United States. Uh, and the, coinc co the coincidences of that temporarily with, um, uh, kind of growing perceptions of collective status threat among the white majority in the United States. Now, everything I've just said and, and captured in this slide is, applies to the United States, but it equally with variations, case specific variations, applies to um, cases as, as diverse as, as the Netherlands, as the United Kingdom, um, as Poland, uh, and maybe beyond. Um, you know, as, as you all know, the rise of nationalist, populist, authoritarian politics is really worldwide. India, the Philippines are, are uh, important cases. Australia has, has its own experiences with this. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the theory can be potentially expanded beyond uh, the specific cases I'm talking about. Now, today, what I want to focus on is first the question of what nationalism is, as I understand it uh, and as I use it in my work, and how it relates to this overarching concept, concept of the radical right. Um, give you a broad overview of a theoretical model that I developed in this book uh, that I'm writing uh, and I've developed in, in past articles to try to answer, give one answer at least, to the question of why the radical right is, is surging now or in the recent past. And, and the, you know, the kind of uh, periodization of this is also up for debate. It's not so recent. I mean, in many countries, it's 40 years old with precursors uh, further back, but it certainly is the case that, is, that the radical right has become mainstreamed in the last 15 to 20 years. So an overview of the, of the overall theoretical model and, um, and uh, kind of spelling out where the empirics I'll show you today fit into that broader model. Uh, and then I'll get to the empirical study itself, where I have a number of uh, hypotheses that, uh, that we analyze, which get to this question, of, you know, which support the, why, the answer for the, to the why now question. Uh, and they have to do with how nationalism was related to 2016 presidential candidates' uh, preferences uh, in the United States both in the general election where Hillary Clinton and, and Donald Trump uh, uh, competed with one another, but also in the, both Democratic and Republican primaries that um, in some ways are even more important because they allowed Trump to capture the Republican Party um, and also featured a, a left populist candidate in Bernie Sanders. And then the second set of hypotheses uh, that I'll explore and show you the, the results for uh, have to do with longer, long time trends that preceded the 2016 election. So, you know, a lot of people uh, wrote in the media that, oh, you know, 2016, Donald Trump created a wave of nativism, xenophobia, and so forth. Um, but of course, that's giving him a lot of credit. Uh, just as likely it is possible that this wave of nativism and other uh, other kind of cultural, political, cultural phenomena that I'll be talking about preceded his candidacy by by quite a long period. Uh, and it was not a product of Trumpism, but really Trumpism was the culmination of, of pre-existing trends. And so those are um, you know, some of the some of the uh, trends that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in that section. And finally, I'll talk very briefly about the implications for next week and beyond, which I think some of you probably would like to talk about more. So we can do that in the Q&A. Um, so the three major puzzles, com puzzles coming back to that. What is the radical right? Uh, this is, you know, I'm not going to be um, uh, going on a long digression on this, I just want to signal what, what I think is important in thinking about this form of politics. So there are many other many labels out there tossed around uh, for, for this form of politics, and uh, a number of you have studied uh, aspects of this form of politics. Uh, so you know you are well aware of uh, Kasmuda's uh, uh, definition of radical right politics, which involves three elements: populism, nationalism, uh, and authoritarianism. 
and I, I fully endorse this um, this formulation. Um, as you know, populism is a way of making political claims. Well, <laughs> there's some debate. So uh, I saw Ben Moffat's here. For him, it's a form of political style, which I, I think is a, is a really uh, uh, relevant and uh, and uh, appropriate definition. Uh, it's a form of discourse for others, a uh, form of political claims making that juxtaposes um, some sort of a corrupt elite with with a glorified people. Uh, it, uh, it that juxtaposition is deeply moral and irreconcilable. Uh, whereby the people must retake political power away from the elites, you know, kick up the, the corrupt elites and, and have unmediated access to political power. Um, there's a massive literature around this. I've contributed to it myself uh, to some degree, uh, and it's important. Uh, but it's only one aspect of radical politics. The, the third aspect over here is authoritarianism, which is really, uh, as I think about it, a mode of political governance. It is often signaled in discourse uh, uh, in election, electoral campaigns, uh, but it is really comes to the fore once radical right actors are in office. It is a way of, of governing that ensures long term access to power through the violation of, of uh, democratic norms, uh, through appointing of uh, essentially, you know, a clientelistic appointments of, of, of apparatchiks in the, in the state and, and kicking out of, of long established nonpartisan uh, bureaucrats uh, through, uh, you know, um, uh, clamping down on, uh, on collective mobilization of various sources of so social protests, on jeopardizing the independence of the ju judiciary and the media, and serve as a, as a final um, step of authoritarian control of the state, uh, undermining um, uh, fair and free democratic elections. And we've seen this play out in a number of cases, Turkey, Russia, Hungary, Poland, um, you know, and elsewhere, and, and to some degree in the United States as well. Um, so those, that's populism and authoritarianism, but I really want to focus on nationalism. Um, this sort of often stated, but rarely fully theorized aspect of radical right politics. When I say nationalism, I mean something very particular. Um, I don't mean long history of nation state building from this, you know, uh, 18th century onward, although certainly that's related. I really mean how people understand their nation. That is what, when they think America, when they think Australia, what comes to mind? What does that sort of national frame of reference mean to them? And so if we think about that, what does Australia mean to you? What does the United States mean to someone or America? Those are important distinctions, actually. Um, it turns out that you know there, there are a bunch of different attitudes that are associated with these cultural models or schemas or construals. Um, and I, I'm illustrating them here just uh, uh, with a few with a few pictures for you. But for the first set is really about who has access to legitimate uh, nation state belonging, right? Who is a legitimate member of the national community? Um, does that depend on uh, one's uh, race? Does that depend on one's language, on one's religion, uh, or not? Uh, is it really uh, a more open-ended kind of uh, um, civic model where all one needs to do is just sort of you know have a, 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 a subjective identification with the nation, respect the laws, and just want to be here? Uh, so there's a long tradition of nationalism research that juxtaposes uh, ethnic and civic nationalism, and that's partly what I'm talking about. Although those two categories are not quite as clean as one uh, might suspect. Um, uh, or as that literature might give you a sense of. So, so one part of these national uh, construals, these understandings of the nation are the boundaries, symbolic boundaries of nationhood, who's in, who's out, who's a legitimate member. But that's not all, right? There's also the relation between the state and the nation uh, and what aspects of both the nation and the state one is proud of or one wants to celebrate and what aspects of the state and nation might one be ashamed of or fearful of. So, you know, the top two uh, images here are really two different views of, of the state in the United States. On the one hand, on the left, uh, uh, a fear of the government, right? Uh, this anti-statist uh, uh, current in American politics, which is quite prominent. On the right, an embrace of the state and nation as, as worthy of celebration. And there are many other ways you can think about this, the kind of the people's construals of the state and nation and their relationship and what it is that they celebrate, what it is that they are fearful or don't have negative sentiments about. And finally, there's also another aspect to nationalist um, uh, beliefs, and that is where the nation uh, uh, is placed vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. And so these two images are supposed to be evocative, really, of two ways of understanding, for, for instance, American military power, right? Is it a humanitarian force for good on the left? Is it the policeman on the world, uh, of the world on the right? Um, and so, but, but really, it's not just about the military. It's really about how one understands where the nation fits into the rest of the world. So chauvinism is, for example, is a belief that one's country is the greatest country in the world and everyone else should be like one's country or one's co-nationals. Um, so that's really what I'm talking about, right? Where the country sits in one's co cognitive model, cultural model vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. The point here is that, that understandings of nationhood are multifaceted. They're multidimensional. And 
all too often in the literature, we pick only one of these sets of attitudes and leave out the others. What I want to suggest is that we should be thinking about these attitudes holistically and importantly, relationally. That is that they are not standalone attitudes, but they cohere into these overarching relational construals of nationhood. So on the one hand here on the left, you've got uh, uh, you know, a toy example of somebody, an individual, or maybe a community who construes of, them, of American membership in broadly open terms, uh, race, religion, language, or not relevant criteria of national belonging, who celebrates the state, who thinks of American uh, military power as humanitarian for most part, on the right, you've got a very different understanding of nationhood where religion is an important criterion of membership as is language, where there's strong skepticism toward the state and kind of a sense of, of the nation having gone downhill uh, and a much more forceful projection of power abroad. Again, these are, uh, these are just hypothetical, but the point here is twofold. First of all, that we can think of these attitudes as, as cohering into overarching cultural models. And we can hopefully, as I'll show you, um, measure them systematically. But also these models are inherently relational in the sense that you can't really tell what one attitude, one belief means in isolation. So if, if, for example, if somebody tells you, I think speaking English is a fundamentally important uh, criterion for being a true American. You can't tell just from that answer whether that person is an, eth an ethno-nationalist, um, has an exclusionary ascriptive definition of American membership or a civic Republican, they merely, think English language competency is important for full political participation and participation in the economy. How can we tell which of those two variants of beliefs does the person holds? Well, we can see what other answers they've given us on the other questions, you know, what other attitudes they hold. So if they also think religion and race are criteria, of, important criteria of legitimate belonging. They're most likely belong to some version of an ethno-nationalist camp. Uh, if that's not important to them, uh, if they're otherwise open to any member, anybody being a member of the, of the nation, as long as they speak the language and participate, more likely they're, you know, we can say they're a civic, civic Republican. So that's just one example to show you that the relationships between the attitudes matter as much as any given attitude in isolation. So the part of the uh, objective of a lot of my research that I'll describe to you in a specific uh, empirical study that I'll get into in more detail is to identify these different competing, potentially competing definitions of nationhood. And I really think of them as nationalist cleavages, as their, their cultural cleavages in within national populations um, that are based on competing, different competing understandings of nationhood. Uh, in past work, I've shown empirically that, there, that they exist, that there's considerable within country heterogeneity and how people understand their own nation. Uh, and actually a lot of between country similarity and how these schemas of nationhood look, at least formally, so structurally. Um, I'm not the first to come up with this idea. It's, there's a, a tradition of work like this, but it's mostly been qualitative work, historical work. So Roger Smith has a book, Civic Ideals, where he shows that different uh, understandings of America have defined American immigration law since the founding of the country. And you can see the residues of these competing understandings in the law. Um, so mine, my work has really been kind of a, a survey-based contemporary counterpart to that, to that terrific book. Um, and in that work that I've done on my own with other co-authors, with Paul DiMaggio in particular in 2016, um, I've shown that these, that these inco inchoate various beliefs really cohere into four robust schemas of nationhood. That no matter what I throw at, at my models, what data, which country, what time period, I keep seeing the same four. Um, and we can discuss why not five, why not three. Uh, but I call them liberal, restrictive, ardent, and disengaged. And I'll get into more detail about what I mean here, but I just want to signal that there are four. They're pretty consistently found. The liberal variant I sometimes call creedal in the US case specifically, because that's an evocative term for one aspect of American nationhood, definitions thereof. But more broadly, outside of the US, I really think of it as liberal nationalism. These four types of nationalism appear to be very patterned in the sense, as I mentioned, that I keep seeing them no matter what I, what I do. Um, and hopefully that's not just entirely my own kind of lens that I can't take off. Uh, I've, I've been very skeptical of my own results on this over and over and over again, um, but I keep seeing the same thing. Uh, they're stable in the sense that they're stable over time for most part in their composition. Um, and to some degree in their distribution, although that's more of an open question, they're systematically correlated with sociodemographic attributes of the people who hold these beliefs. So they're, they're quite predictable based on people's um, uh, sociodemographic characteristics. They're also associated pretty systematically in a patterned way with political attitudes. And that's something that I've studied in the past and shown in the past in the US, but also across European countries and, and outside actually in, in one study with Australia as well, um, although that hasn't been published yet. Um, and, uh, and you know, they're, they're real, they're rooted in people's everyday experiences to some degree in their social networks and in their, in their, in their socialization. Um, 
But importantly, these forms of understanding and these kind of different variants of national self-understanding are mostly latent. That is, they're not the only identity and not usually the primary identity through which people uh, uh, carry on their lives and, and behave politically. Uh, there are other things that often matter. Their economic uh, conditions, their other identities, their identities as parents, as uh, workers, as um, you know, uh, uh, gender identities, racial identities, and so forth. So um, although the racial part and the nationalist part have quite important uh, overlaps. So the point is that, that they're always there, but they're not always the primary, uh, uh, primary ways in which people think about the world. However, they can become primary. They can become more salient and become mobilized politically under certain circumstances and certain political his, uh, moments. And I want to argue that 2016 was one such uh, political moment, um, to which I'll get in a second. Interestingly, uh, uh, in the early 2000s, based on research I did in 20, uh, that was published in 2016, these four types of nationalism, in the United States at least, cut across party. That is, you couldn't actually uh, predict if somebody was a Democrat or Republican, if you knew their nationalist beliefs. And likewise, you couldn't uh, very well determine what someone, how someone imagined the nation just based on their partisan identification. So there were, these were not re mutually reinforcing cleavages, that is na nationhood and party. Uh, they were cross-cutting. These um, types of nationalism also cut across ideology, party identification, as I mentioned, and race uh, in the early 2000s. And the question is, do they still? Um, they ha these nationalist beliefs have not been uh, had not been studied uh, in uh, in, a, in terms of how they predict voting preferences. So that's one of the objectives for uh, for the latter half of the talk today. Um, and also, uh, their trends over time have not really been examined in much detail. So that is a long answer to what is the radical right. Now, uh, 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 probably equally long answer to why has it been surging, but then the consequences part, I'll, I'll leave out for most part. So why has it been surging in Europe? Why has it been surging in the United States? Um, in a nutshell, my argument, argument in the book, argument and things I've written in the past is that these nationalist cleavages, these, these disagreements about what the nation is and what it ought to be, um, are actually the fuel for the rise of radical right politics. Anti-elitism and low institutional trust, which are evoked by populism, by populist claims, stoke that fire. And then the result of that is greater tolerance for authoritarian rule. So there's a bit of a causal sequence here that, um, that I, I, I wanna argue for, um, but, but it's important to know that none of this stuff is new, right? Nationalist claims are not new in politics, populist claims are not new, and authoritarianism is not new. I mean, you know, it goes way back, but, but even in the last 40 years, it's been around, right? And it's and, and politicians have, have used these forms of claims making. Likewise, on the demand side, these attitudes are not new. They're, you know, these these cleav these nationalist cleavages have been around for a long time, as far as my data that I can get my hands on uh, show. Um, so how do we explain change, that is the rise, rise of radical right politics, with what seems like stability on both the supply and demand side? That seems that's that seems problematic. And so I want to argue that even though they've been around, and even if they're stable in their, in their overall aggregate distribution, at least on the demand side, there is shifting salience. That is, pre-existing claims and pre-existing beliefs under, are, are, are resonating in new ways under new circumstances. And I'll, I'll describe the circumstances in a second, um, right? They are, these new circumstances are a result of changing structural, cultural, structural conditions. Um, so, as, as, as society shifts and changes and transforms culturally, politically, economically, demographically, um, all of a sudden you're, we're finding ourselves in new circumstances that are making these pre-existing frames and pre-existing um, pre frames, claims, uh, pre-existing beliefs resonate anew. Importantly, these changes, these culturally mediated changes that I'm talking about, some need not be real. That is, many of them are real in some, to some degree, but many are only perceived and blown out of proportion by opportunistic political elites. And that's important to keep in mind as I describe some of these specific changes. Because very often one can say, well, that's not actually happening. That's correct. Some seed of that, of that perception may be out there, but it's drummed up as a fear and sort of, sort of source of anxiety by, uh, by opportunistic elites. So what are these changes that I'm talking about? Um, both real and perceived. There are obviously economic changes, and and I really don't. You know, there, there's a long debate in the literature, both media and scholarly. Um, is it is it the economy or is it culture? And I, I want to argue that that dichotomy is actually misguided because um, there is no clear distinction between those two things. The economy is culturally perceived and understood, 
Uh, and likewise, uh, uh, there are other cultural sources of, of, um, of grievance that are not just race and nationalism as, or nativism, uh, as people often reduce culture to. So culture kind of envelops all of this in my view, nonetheless. So some of these things are economic, right? Economic change, um, economic crises, for instance, these punctuated moments of crisis, but also longer term trends in deindustrialization and the offshoring of jobs, uh, increasing precariousness of economic conditions, but not just the economy, it's also dem demography, right? It's about immigration, about refugee crises. Um, certainly that's that's something that Europeans are familiar with, Australians and uh, New Zealanders as well. Um, it's about changing demographics of countries. Um, and this is where the perceived and real thing becomes important because in some places there is actually a, a shifting uh, a, a growth of immigration. In other places like the US immigration actually has tapered down, especially for Mexico, but nonetheless, the moral panic about it continues. So demographic changes, national security threats, terrorist attacks and so forth, which are often conflated and, and fused with fears of immigration uh, uh, and, and demographic change. Um, also, uh, shifting um, um, conceptions about social justice, uh, which, you know, in the U.S. case, for example, affirmative action is something, how do we, you know, how, how, why would I bring that up in this context of shifting, changing cultural so social conditions? Because all of these features of change are giving a sense of insecurity to the same population, that is the white majority. Um, for many of whom rules of the game are changing and, and affirmative action is one aspect of that. And their collective status is being threatened. Again, per, the perception is their collective status is being threatened. All of these changes have that same feature. And as do changes in popular culture. So I'm simplifying here, but if you think back to, you know, 50s, 60s uh, in the United States in popular culture, white, lower middle class, working class was glorified in, in many ways. And that's changed over time. Popular culture has become more multicultural. Now, I'm not arguing again by any means that Hollywood and the entertainment business is equitable like, along racial and ethnic lines, and it certainly is not. White, uh, white uh, entertainers continue to dominate this business, but there is certainly a perception of a changing logic and of a changing um, um, kind of set of norms in popular culture, all for the good. Uh, all for the good from my standpoint, <laughs> not necessarily all for the good from the standpoint of the people who are threatened by this. Um, Social movements, as you well know, um, protests against police brutality in the United States, Black Lives Matter have been a, a, a long-standing feature of American political culture. Another perceived source of political change and, and cultural change. Uh, and in some ways, the, the vilification of, of Barack Obama was a perfect storm of all of this stuff, right? Um, it was deep, a deep racialization of him as an individual, delegitimization of him as a, as a president and of the president of the office of the president and of the entire state for that matter. Um, so in a, the election of, of the first black president was what this kind of idiosyncratic moment in American politics in the sense that it's not duplicated in other countries necessarily, but it was an additional source of, of, of perceived change. So these are, the point here is that there is a, there's a lot of change happening, some real, some perceived, all of which can be conflated quite easily by skillful politicians and media elites who say, look, you should be afraid of all this stuff. Importantly, I also wanna add, which of these changes is the most important, these structural culture is the most important, varies across cases. So I'm, in some places, refugee crises are the most important thing in terms of kind of creating this, this fear of, of, uh, of status loss. In other places, it's really about the economy. Uh, uh, in other places, it's about a fear of sort of a phantom fear of minorities that don't even exist in that country, as it is the case in Eastern Europe. Um, but the point is that all of all of these different uh, uh, kind of anxiety producing um, stimuli can be can be politically profitable. And so over the overall theoretical model looks roughly like this. Um, so on the top, you've got supply side factors, that is um, the kind of uh, uh, offering, political offering that, that uh, candidates and politicians and general political elites with the aid of media elites are presenting to the people. On the bottom, you've got the demand side, that is people's preferences, beliefs, and, and, um, and uh, um, political choices. And on each side, you've got these three features, nationalism, populism, and authoritarianism, and claims, and in some corresponding attitudes. As I've mentioned, in the aggregate, there isn't that much going on. That is, most countries, in the U.S. in particular, um, nationalism is not increasing. It's not, the U.S. is not becoming more xenophobic, more racist, more exclusionary, and if anything, the opposite. Uh, so it's either pretty stable in terms of these attitudes or in, becoming actually more inclusive. Um, and on the, on the supply side, on the claim side, as I've mentioned, nationalist, populist, and authoritarian claims have been around for a while. So if you just, just look at the aggregate, you may be led to think that nothing's going on. Now, I wanna actually complicate that a little bit. I think there is important, there are important things going on. 
On the supply side, what you have is parties and politicians playing around with populism when it works, keeping that set of frames, playing around with nationalism, holding on to that when it works, playing around with authoritarian claims, and when that works, sticking to it. Essentially, taking these three forms of claims making and, and, and recombining them into a sing single winning combination, this kind of discursive package. Um, a winning formula, kind of like Kitschel once argued, but with slightly different components because neoliberalism is not as prominent here. Um, and I actually have a paper in the works that shows how this happened in, in European parties where it was really kind of a, a, an evolutionary process almost where people would try stuff out and when it worked, they would keep it. And then the, the winning formula would diffuse across countries as countries and parties learn from one another. The other thing that's happening on the supply side that may be kind of hidden by aggregate stability is the fusion of these of these frames. So I have an, an experimental study that um, is under review right now where I show that if you expose America to just purely populist anti-elite claims with nothing else, a subset of the, of the respondents will have stronger antipathy towards minorities. And that subset are those who support Trump and are uh, Republicans, but particularly Trump supporters, uh, which shows that that Trump and Republicans have essentially fused populism and nationalism so that one stands in for the other. Populism becomes a dog whistle for nationalism. So that's that's what's happening under the aggregate stability on the supply side. On the demand side, all of these attitudes in the aggregate are stable. Underneath, there's a lot of churning happening, a lot of sorting of beliefs across parties. And the question for today is partly, um, do nationalist beliefs also, have they also sorted by party? You also have the erosion of other identities, the erosion of identities like labor identities. Uh, since, the, since the labor unions have been decimated in the United States and, uh, starting in, in the 70s, really picking up in the early 80s, labor identity, which used to be a very powerful collective uh, identification, source of identification and, and, a, and, a, and a channel into the Democratic Party, has eroded dramatically. And, um, and I, I want to argue that national identity, a particular kind of national identity, has filled in that gap. So that's another feature. Okay. So that's what's happening on the claims and the belief side, but then you've got these changes I was talking about, these structural changes, some of them real, some of them perceived um, that create anxiety and fear in the population, a particular segment of the population, especially white majorities. Those fears and anxieties are largely inchoate, right? They're, they're kind of poorly specified. They're, there's a sense that stuff is happening that's endangering me and people like me, fill in the blanks. But it is political elites and, and, their, and their supporters in the media and elsewhere including some intellectuals that channel those fears, those inchoate fears into resentments toward ad groups, into very focused resentments. So you're scared of demographic change, you're scared of uh, terrorism, you're scared of economic um, downturns, blame those people over there. And invariably those people over there are some, com some combination of elites and minorities that are in cahoots with them, right? Uh, whether it's immigrants, racial minorities, domestic racial minorities, uh, religious minorities and so forth. And so the way that those fears get turned into the resentment is by creating the sense of perceived collective, st collective status threat. You white Americans used to be at the heart of the country. You're losing that status. You're losing that, that prominent role in the collective imaginary and the economy, demographically and so forth. Once that happens, all of a sudden, these pre-existing uh, claims and, and attitudes that I was talking about start resonating in you. And what results is a mobilization of these nationalist cleavage as I talked about that have been late, had been latent but are now becoming activated which leads to the success of radical right parties. Now, when this, once this whole thing happens, it's remarkable how quickly it diffuses. That is, people across countries, politicians across countries who can disagree fundamentally on ideology and, and you know, could be a totally different sides of various geopolitical battles, will borrow from one another the strategies involved here. In, in kind of drumming up the fears, channeling them towards resentments, creating a sense of status threat and, 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 and awakening these nationalist cleavages of various sorts uh, for their own ends. That's the big model. Now I'm just gonna, in the time that remains and it, it won't be long, I'm gonna focus on one particular part of this. The nationalist cleavages as predictors of, of, national, of radical right mobilization. And I'll mention a little bit about the structural shocks and the discourse as well, but I'll really focus in on that bottom arrow. So how do I do that? The point is that uh, I want to see whether these nationalist cleavages I talked about, whether they're related, uh, whether, first of all, I can identify in 2016, whether they look the way that they did in the past, and whether they're related to voting preferences. Uh, uh, based on how candidates frame their claims in nationalist terms, do we see the, the belief sides, the, the demand side, nationalist beliefs uh, corresponding to those claims? Um, so modeling whether nationalism was a significant predictor of 2016 uh, voting preferences, and then seeing what happened uh, in terms of the, the trends in these nationalist beliefs over time, and particularly whether they became sorted by party over time. And if so, that gives us a sense that 
even if demand hasn't been growing for ethnic nationalist politics in the general, in general, maybe it has in one party, in the Republican Party in particular. I use survey data for this, um, a number of uh, four, uh, four cross-sectional attitudinal surveys with the same set of nationalism questions. Two of them are standard uh, publicly available surveys, the GSS, which is part of the International Social Survey Program, that supplement, and two, which I ran myself. The 2016 survey that makes up the bulk of the, of the voting preference analysis, I collected the weekend before the 2016 election. Uh, with YouGov, and we're doing uh, a follow-up uh, this week, currently, right now, before the 2020 election. The battery of nationalism items I use is pretty standard. Uh, you will find it on many, many surveys, especially on the ISSB. Um, there are 23 items. They ask respondents about how strong, how close they feel to the nation, um, what criteria of national belonging are important to them, so what makes a true Australian, a true American, is it religion? Is it uh, birth in the country? Is it ancestry? Or is it just respect for the laws, et cetera? Uh, a series of questions on domain-specific pride. How proud are you of economic accomplishments of the nation, of its accomplishment arts and entertainment? Uh, of the, uh, How proud are you of the state of the state of democracy and so forth? And then a set of questions about chauvinism uh, and, and beliefs about the nation's relationship to the rest of the world. Would, would the world be better if everyone was, was like Americans is one of the questions. Um, I have my own answer to that, but I'll, uh, I won't editorialize. Um, so these are essentially the four clusters of attitudes that I showed you in those pictures, right? But but in much more length and depth. And then I use a method called latent class analysis that essentially identifies clusters of respondents who share a profile of beliefs, uh, uh, of attitudes, of responses to these attitudes. Um, so let me just very briefly tell you what latent class analysis does in a nutshell, just so you have a sense of what I did. If you imagine this to be a hypothetical data set, You've got the nationalist variables, in this case, five in the columns, and then you've got respondents in the rows. Um, and what latent class analysis does, if we assume that those numbers correspond to uh, Likert scale responses from one to four, let's say, from strongly disagree to strongly agree with some nationalist variable, the, in the insight is, the intuition is that if somebody has a particular profile of responses, that corresponds to one way of understanding the nation. And latent class analysis will essentially identify people with shared patterns of responses. So respondent A, C, and F respond to the survey the same way. They understand the nation, therefore, in similar ways. Uh, same with B, D, and E, and then G is an isolate. And latent class analysis will then essentially create these clusters in the, in the sample. Now, it's never quite this clean, but you get the picture, right? And so if we assume that surveys measure anything and that Likert scale responses measure anything, you know, we can kind of go through those assumptions. But if but but what we're getting here are shared profiles of responses across nationalism questions. When we do that with our data, when we enter the, the, these 5,000 observations, the 23 national variables into latent class analysis, what I end up with again are the same four latent classes that I talked about, the four types of nationalism, which I call creedal or liberal, restrictive, ardent, and disengaged. And um, I, I, you know, I could get go for a long time, go on for a long time about what, what they mean. I'm just gonna, no, this is kind of their composition, but I'll just, I'll just summarize this for you in a second uh, or in a few seconds. Creedal nationalists are kind of the stereotypical liberal centrist nationalists in the United States. Moderate levels of attachment to the nation, inclusive boundaries of the nation, high levels of pride, as often is the case among American uh, liberal nationalists, um, and moderate levels of chauvinism. Those whom I call restrictive nationalists are high levels of attachment, exclusionary boundaries of the nation, but interestingly, low levels of pride in a nation and especially the state and moderate chauvinism. So exclusionary, but low pride and not as chauvinistic as you'd expect. Ardent nationalists are high across the board. These are like the jingoistic rah-rah-rah American nationalists, right? Um, high levels of attachment, ethno-religious boundaries of nationhood, high levels of pride across various domains and high levels of chauvinism, right? High across the board. And finally, the disengaged are those who have an arm's length relationship to the nation. They are moderate in their attachment, open-minded in terms of national membership, low levels of pride in the nation and state, and low levels of chauvinism. The one takeaway take take I want you to get from this is that these are not monotonically varied. It doesn't go from low nationalism to high nationalism. This is not just a continuum. These are cross-cutting categories. There are some things that creedals and the disengaged share, like civic open-minded criteria of national membership, inclusiveness, inclusiveness. But then there are other things that creedal nationalists share with ardent nationalists, like high levels of pride. And importantly, restrictives and the disengaged both have low levels of pride, especially in the state, even though they disagree about definitions of national boundaries. So these are cross-cutting, qualitatively different understandings of nationhood. Did they predict 2016 election votes and how did they change over time? Whether they predicted the votes depends on what the what was on offer. And you all know what was on offer to some degree, right? Trump's campaign was exclusionary. 
the, the wall with Mexico, uh, fear mongering, and a pretty dismal view of where the US is and where it's heading. And Trump is the answer, make America great again. For Clinton, the campaign was much more inclusive about America as a nation of immigrants, diversity, and a celebration of American politics and institutions. So that's the, that was, this is the intuition. And then we do a bunch of uh, computational text analysis work to, on campaign speeches to determine if this was actually the case. I won't go through that all in detail because it would take too long and I'm out of time. Um, but just to give you a sense of one, we asked what does, what's associated with Trump's use of the word dangerous in his speeches. The closer two concepts are in the space, the more they co-occur and the more closely related they are and their meaning in Trump's speeches. So what's dangerous for Trump? Terror, criminals, turmoil, pouring over the borders, aliens, um, refugees, drug cartels, violent, just throw it all out there, right? Like anything that can scare people in terms of um, um, otherness, right? Combined with crime and terrorism. And also for Trump, politics is about failure, arrogance, entrenchment, the establishment, corruption, and so forth. So this is kind of the populist nationalist part of it. And we did the same thing for the other candidates and not surprisingly, Clinton was inclusive. Uh, and celebratory of the institutions in American uh, society. Um, Sanders was or kind of orthogonal to nationalism. He did not evoke nationalism very much, but was very populist. And he's, his view of politics actually resembled that of Trump here, what I'm showing you here. Um, uh, the moderate Republicans in the primary were actually quite similar to Clinton, not exclusionary, not at the nationalist in the way Trump was, uh, and quite mainstream in terms of celebrating uh, the American institutions. And then finally, Cruz was very much like Trump. You know, very similar, uh, especially as this campaign progressed. So we did that with with word embeddings to make sure that our intuitions about this are right, which led us to the following hypotheses. Uh, and this is almost the end. Whether the first hypothesis is that Trump supporters, those who voted for Trump over Clinton, should be more likely to be restrictive nationalists and ardent nationalists. Two pathways, both exclusionary, but one very low on pride and one high on pride. Um, so the idea is that they're kind of multi-causal pathways toward those vote preferences. Those who voted for Clinton should be more likely to be creedal nationalists, these kind of mainstream liberal nationalists, or have a disengaged position from, uh, uh, relationship to the nation. Both inclusive, one high, one low pride. Trump versus moderates should be similar to Trump versus Clinton, because moderates were very similar to Clinton and their construals of the nation. And finally, Trump versus Cruz, we don't expect too much difference. Finally, finally, Clinton versus Sanders, because Clinton was sort of assertively nationalist, although inclusive and creedal in her views of the nation. And Sanders was not, Sanders was not. He wasn't very nationalist at all, but he had this kind of dismal view of the state of American society, particularly on economic terms. So our intuition here was that disengagement from the nation, this kind of arm's length relationship to the nation should be associated with Sanders support more than Clinton support. Finally, in terms of what happened over long term, um, one possibility is Trump wrote a wave that he created right before 2016 of, of kind of exclusionary nationalism. But another possibility is what I suggest is that actually this has been long in the making and the parties have sorted on their beliefs about nation, American nationhood. So finally, the results, um, these are results for Clinton versus Trump. Anything to the right of that dashed line suggests uh, um, greater support, support for Trump. So what this means is that creedal nationalists as we had expected were much more likely to vote for Clinton than, anyone, than, than any of the others. And disengaged ardent and restrictives were more likely to vote for Trump compared to creedals. So consistent with our expectations. And this was the case if nationalism was the only variable in the equation, or if we also control for demographic characteristics and even party ID, which is interesting, right? Because at the end of the day, Republicans vote Republican, Democrats vote Democrat in general elections. Um, but nonetheless, when you control for party ID, nationalism is still significant, even in the general election. Um, Trump versus moderate, similar pattern to Trump versus Clinton. Creedal nationalism more likely uh, to be associated with moderate support in the primary versus Trump. Trump versus Cruz, no significant differences. And finally, Clinton versus Sanders. As expected, disengagement from the nation was predictive in all of these cases of support for Sanders over Clinton. So um, those who didn't feel strongly about the nation, but who are not very proud of where the nation was going at the same time, especially the state, were more likely to support Sanders over Clinton. Now let's look what happened over time. And this is the last set of results. And this is the aggregate for the, for the, the entire sample of the US population. There is stuff happening here, obviously, and especially around 2004, following the 9-11 attacks. There is churn here. But if you compare it to where things stood in 1996, these are the four types of nationalism, in 1996 versus 2016, so that's a time series from 96 to 2016, the distribution doesn't change all that much. It, there is kind of fluctuation, but not a clear secular trend. But look what happens when we look at the parties. This is Democrats. In 1996, on the left side here, 
all four types of nationalism were represented among Democrats, um, and uh, creedal nationalists and restrictives were actually equally pre present. By 2016, there's a massive change. And let me just zoom in on those that, were, that show the biggest change. Creedal nationalism becomes modal, restrictive nationalism um, goes down significantly among, among Democrats. Compared to where that was 96, this is a massive change. Now Republicans, restrictive nationalism goes up and creedal nationalism goes down. Again, in 96, there was a lot of heterogeneity among Republicans and how they understood the nation. By 2016, restrictive nationalism is modal um, and creedal nationalism has gone from about 35% to uh, just about 20%, a 15 point drop. So Republicans who are liberal nationalists who view the nation in inclusive ways, um, proud but inclusive ways are declining in their prevalence whereas these exclusionary low pride restrictives and moderate chauvinism restrictives are skyrocketing. Um, even more so among strong Republicans and strong Democrats. And this summarizes it. So the probability of your association between party and nationalism essentially. So how likely it is that you're Republican if you're a creedal nationalist? That has dramatically dropped. How likely are you that you're restrictive, uh, sorry, that you're Republican if you're a restrictive nationalist has skyrocketed. So we see a lot of evidence of partisan sorting of nationalist beliefs. And this is significant because all of a sudden the two parties can't even agree on what the nation means, right? This is not just any attitude. This is not just any policy domain. This is a fundamental collective identity, a master identity, but what it means to be American. And there's growing fundamental conflict between the two parties about what America means and where, where it ought to be in the future. So nationals has, has, is the, these nationals cleavages were central to the election, I want to argue, in 2016. Um, uh, you, you know, the hypotheses were, as I explained to you, as I described to you. Um, and even though nationals many aggregated either either stable, maybe becoming a little more inclusive, uh, there's evidence of a considerable partisan sorting of nationalist beliefs that maybe, I want to argue, maybe was catalyzed by 9-11 to some degree. Um, but, but has been steadily growing in, in, sort of in terms of the partisan disparity over time which suggests that among Republicans, the demand for a Trump-like politics has been around for a long time. And that's why we had the Tea Party movement. That's why we had Sarah Palin as a candidate. But it was only Trump that was able to articulate these grievances in a particularly effective way and build on the successes of his predecessors, Palin, Tea Party, et cetera, and really um, capitalize on this long-standing demand for exclusionary Trumpist-like politics. Implications for 2020, I should probably for the q and I just want to say, hey, we're in, we're in some trouble <laughs> uh, so far. Um, I think the damage has been limited by Trump's gross incompetence, but there are other Trumps waiting in the sidelines who would be much more effective, and that's a dangerous possibility. Um, and I think if Trump loses, others will, others will try to emulate him, and the Republican Party will face an important choice. Do you double down on Trumpism and this form of politics? Or do you do what you, you know, what Republicans tried to do or thought about doing a good, uh, you know, uh, six, eight, seven years ago, which was to um, take advantage of a big potential base of uh, Latino voters who are socially conservative and willing to vote Republican if Republicans just let go of their ethnic nationalism. Um, and I think one way to prevent um, kind of worse Trumps coming along is for Democrats to find a way to change the conversation and decrease the salience of nationalism in American politics, move toward other topics that are potentially maybe more relevant to people. Um, if all of this plays out well next week, and I don't know if it will, but if it does, and it's not just next week, but going forward, I think the first thing the US has to do is fix its institutions. And I can talk about what I mean by that. And then perhaps reclaim a leadership role and, and try to mitigate the threat of this kind of politics beyond the United States and other countries as well, in concert with its allies, who I think are waiting for the US to come back, maybe still waiting, hopefully still waiting to come back. I'll end there. Sorry, I went really, really long, but I look forward to the next half an hour of questions. Yeah, great. Thanks, Bart. Um, I might get you to unshare your screen when you have a moment, just so that um, yes, I can gladly. see everyone's face. Um, thank um, you. That, I think everyone will agree that that was just a really rich um, and yeah, beautifully articulated set of data that was just fascinating uh, for us. So really, thank you for sharing um, all of that material with us and, and opening our eyes to these complex ways in which uh, nationalism is playing out in the US. Um, I'll open the floor for questions if people can just kind of um, raise their hands and then sort of unmute themselves. We'll, I can see James. I can't see everyone at once. So um, perhaps sort of put your comments in the chat box if you like. So perhaps we'll go James and then Zim. Bart, are you happy to take a couple at a time? Sometimes that's a better. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, Three so perhaps fine. we'll. 
we'll have two to, I can see two at the moment. So we'll have James and then Zim, and then we'll see how we go. Thanks, Ben, and uh, thanks, Bart. Um, I just have, a, I have two things, a comment, which might, um, you might be useful for your analysis, but uh, you can take it or leave it, it's really up to you. But um, uh, the, the other one is a question. So um, just with the economic side of things, um, there was a lot of obsession with this uh, white, um, white middle class or becoming a working class um, uh, and poverty in the United States. And it's interesting that Thomas Piketty in his latest book, he, he, he's very obsessed with this idea that from the seventies onwards, with the changes in taxation, it's created what he calls inequality regimes and he ties it to that. But um, so I, I, that just came to mind as you were talking about it, because often people tend to think more recently about financial crises and they, uh, Piketty's analysis is interesting, but I'm, I'm sure you're aware of it. But what I wanted to, my actual comment is about the, uh, the Marxist view. Now I'm not a Marxist, so I'm not saying politically a Marxist, but I'm talking about Marxian analysis of the of political economy. One of the things that they often say in, in times like the rise of right wing and fascism, um, populism, fascist populism, is that it, it often succeeds when the what they call the petty bourgeoisie are squeezed. So when your shop owners, your small business owners are financially squeezed, they become politically disillusioned and they become available to the right wing. And it's just an interesting um, concept because even in our lockdown, what, we've, what I've noticed, I'm sure other people have noticed, that a lot of the people who are putting forward very right-wing views, like conspiracy views, QAnon and the rest of it, my own observation and my own social circle, they're coming from those shop owners who are angry with the state for being locked down, essentially. They, they're they buying into conspiracies. But that's just, that's my comment. So I just thought I'd share that with you to see if um, it was, uh, it, if you can take it or leave it if it's useful or not. Um, my question's about nationalism itself. Um, uh, Sinisha Malasevich, in his recent book, Grounded Nationalisms, uh, he tries to, I mean, it's not really his thing specific, specifically, but he sort of tries to say that um, nationalism is not, nationalism is pervasive to the point where we don't notice it. We only notice it when it's violent. And when it's violent, it's unusual. So he's sort of building on Michael Billig's view of banal nationalism. He says that it's not banal, that is nationalism. And nationalism starts with your nationality. It's not like 50 years ago where you had stateless people. That was actually a normal thing in the Middle East, in Europe. It's now that you have... Um, Everyone has a nationality. It's unusual not to have a nationality. So his argument is nationality starts with your passport. Now, his system of looking at it is through ideology, organisation, and that quotidian nationalism, which is really all interlinked with what you're talking about. But one question I had to you, I mean, uh, I can't go into all the interesting things that I'd love to say. Ben and I are working on something on sectarianism in Iraq, which, or sectarianism in the Middle East, which um, it taps into a lot of the American examples because... What's really happening in Malasevich's view is you have a, when you have violence, you're having a competition over the state. You're having um, people competing for what, for what, how they define that national identity. And, um, and in a de democratic forum, that's often where you're going to have those conversations the most. There are a couple of things interlinking, um, but that's, um, that, that is perfect sort of place for having those tensions played out and people building mm -hmm. on them. So my, my question um, for you is, uh, I mean, because we're seeing this around the world as well, in other countries as well. To what extent do you uh, see uh, the Democratic Forum? The, I mean, 2016 was an election year. It was there were several different. There was a referendum in the UK. There were a number of different um, public forums where people were giving their vote. What part does that play in specifically uh, this sort of aggressive nationalism on the rise of it? Okay. Right. Um, thanks, James. We'll just get one more from Zim. Thanks a lot, Bart. This is a fantastic project, and I, I look forward to reading your book when it comes out. Um, there, there were many intriguing aspects of, of your presentation. For me, um, the one that stood out was your description of partisan sorting. And I'm curious about uh, your account of why, how and why this has happened. Uh, is it as, re as a result of opinion change? Has it been led by, by the elites? Uh, I just kind of think of other moments or other other developments of sort of that partisan sorting um phenomenon and you know it's 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 rare and normally something big has happened um it's involved mm -hmm. migration or abolition of slavery or, or or something like this and i'm wondering um uh, given the the profoundness of what you're talking about uh, how you how you account for for this development thank you um terrific question thanks james and Sim. um so uh, there's a lot to talk about here. I, you know, the, 
class analysis is is tricky in some ways with respect to uh, this the, this topic because it was sort of the, the most obvious first answer that a lot of people had for what was going on. And then when they started digging a little bit, well, it turned out that well, you know, working class is a is a tough category to to um, place at the center of the explanation in the United States because first of all, the working class in the U.S. is mostly not white. So when we talk about the working class, it's really you know it's really the white working class that then people start honing in on. And then as more analyses start coming up, people start realizing, well, actually, well, you know, it's not really just the white working class; it's also the white middle class. And it's really white people that are voting for Trump, right? Until you get to kind of, uh, you know, uh, college plus, right? At that point, it's no longer a majority. Um, and so, so the, the, the simple, simplistic kind of Marxist explanation that is, you know, kind of a, a crude uh, um, caricature of Marx, that it's about working class grievance doesn't bear out. But a more rich reading of, a uh, rich reading that you're offering of Marx, where it's actually about the bourgeoisie as well being squeezed, there may be a little more to that for sure, in the sense that it is, you know, middle class whites um, who are supporting Trump uh, quite ex uh, extensively. Um, certainly some of them have seen a squeeze, right? Um, the, the, I guess the, the trouble is that many of his supporters did not. That is, they were financially fine. They were economically fine. Um, those who were really suffering were non-white people in, in economically precarious positions. But what those whites were seeing is kind of maybe their neighbors, maybe their cousins, maybe people, you know, people like them on TV experiencing hardship. And so I think there is this kind of um, a moment where it becomes sociotropic and not just individual, right? And so it's not just you're being squeezed, it's people like you are being squeezed. And very quickly we get to an intersection of class and, and race and class and, and nationalism as well. So I think the way I would think about this is that I'm kind of, I'm certainly open to economic grievances being a very important feature of the explanation. I just think that those economic grievances are not, um, uh, are not, um, they're, they're not sufficient for explaining the entire gamut of, of, of sources of support. Um, very quickly, it, it becomes about class and ethnicity, class and race. Um, and actually, as somebody mentioned uh, in a comment, which I'll get to hopefully later, gender as well in interesting ways. Um, the other way that the, the economic uh, um, explanation gets a little complicated is when you look cross-nationally, is that countries that were not hit by crises or that weathered the crises relatively well, like some countries in Eastern Europe, um, still had pretty extensive support for this form of politics for other reasons. Now we can get into inequality in places like Poland and who are the winners and losers of the post 90s transition. I mean, there's a lot of post 90s transition. It gets pretty complicated and economics are certainly not completely out of the picture, but there's more going on than just that, uh, I would argue. So I, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm an advocate of a multi-causal explanation for the, the timing and the nature of the rise of the radical right where economic grievances are certainly reasonable. Uh, as, a re as a reasonable explanation, but they are not an exhaustive explanation. Uh, and they're more likely to work for some subsets of the su of supporters than others, in some countries more than others. Um, so I, I hope that answers at least partly the question, but it's a really interesting question and, a, and, a, and a, one worthy of further discussion. On um, Milosevic on, 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 and his inspiration from Michael Billig, I share that inspiration too, in the sense that I, I really think about nationalism as grounded in everyday experience and banal nationalism and everyday nationalism, the two literatures that have come out um, of, the, of the UK tradition have been really, really useful. Um, so for me, it is about the flagging of the nation routinely on an everyday basis by street names and by you know currency and all the other stuff that Billig writes about. Um, it's just that for a lot of the scholars in that tradition, they're really interested in when, it's sort of an identity salience, right? When do people think about themselves in national terms more or less? And how is the nation reproduced as an important identity on an ongoing basis? And it is through these quotidian interactions with national national symbols, uh, through sports, right, through Olympics, and and, and so forth. Um, and so I, I, I'm on board with that. But then I want to ask which kind of nationalism is being flagged by which kinds of symbols, right? So kind of now that we now that we're on board with the idea that there's this quotidian kind of interactive nature to nationalism. Why, why do people hold competing con uh, conceptions of nationhood and which, when, under what circumstances are some of those more likely to become manifest and salient and politically mobilizable? Um, and and um, so, so that sort of is kind of a friendly amendment to that literature to some degree. Um, the question related to that uh, about kind of nationalism in, in demo democratic politics and nationalism as violence yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I think there is a good argument in that literature that 
people tend to think of nationalism as somebody else's problem until it becomes violent, right? Like nationalism is not an issue here. And when I started, you know, I started studying nationalism in grad school, American nationalism, and a lot of my friends and colleagues were like, ah, oh, it's kind of an esoteric topic. And I said, look, I grew up outside of the United States. As for anyone who's not American, it's not an esoteric topic at all. We always think of American nationalism as like an uber nationalism. But of course, there are nationalism in every, nationalisms in every country and there are nationalist cleavages and, and, and competing divisions in every country that we tend, that many people tend to be blind toward in their own setting, but are, you know, but have an easy time identifying it elsewhere in other time periods in other countries and so forth. Um, so I think there are, that you're absolutely right, that when nationalism becomes violent, it's very difficult to then ignore it. Um, but there is a precursor to nationalism becoming violent quite often, and that is, that is nationalism becoming salient culturally and politically in everyday interactions and in political contests. And so, which often slips into violence in one way or another and often is a precursor to violence, right? So, I mean, you can think of the historical case of Nazi Germany and, and elsewhere, right? Violence was, became a routine part of that politics as it developed, but it was first drummed up as a politics of fear, a politics of resentment, the politics of, of, of fundamental kind of irreconcilable differences between a vision of, of, of what Germany is and ought to be. Um, and, I, and you know, when you think about what's been go going on in the United States for the last while, at least four years, but, but longer, the slippage toward violence has been happening over and over again. It's just, it's still easy for people to dismiss it as, oh, those are just some extremist radicals, right? Um, but of course those extremist radicals have been encouraged by the president of the United States routinely. Uh, as in, Char you know, in Charlottesville and, and elsewhere. Um, and, you know, there was just a plot to kidnap and maybe murder the governor of Michigan recently, right? Again, encouraged by the president. And so there is a sense in which the, the political contest over what America means and what ought to be almost uh, inevitably will lead, it's so, it's so deeply imbued with, with sort of passionate politics and deep conflict about who we are and who, you know, which camp, camp one belongs to, that it almost inevitably leads to actual violence of one form or another. And a lot of people are concerned about what's going to happen after next Tuesday, regardless of the outcome, you know, will there be violence? Yeah, some views on that too, it's hard to predict, but, um, but I think where I think where I think that the Billig tradition and and, and Milosevic's book and others, you know, is to, is are important to point to nationalism in lieu of violence or before the violent stage occurs, and to see that there is a danger in having us argue primarily about who we are as a nation from very different camps. And if there's anything that can be done in politics to to kind of tone that down and replace it with another set of identities, another set of subjects that are of, uh, that people care about, because people have multiple identities, um, then I think it can take some of that fuel out of the fire. But once you, you know, to mix a bunch of metaphors, once you kind of open this box, it's very hard to close it, right? I think I think it's going to be very difficult for people to just shift, shift conversations after next Tuesday if Biden wins. Trump is going to be around. Trumpism is going to be around. This very... Uh, deep, powerful, emotional nationalism is going to be around. Um, so I, I know this is kind of just kind of riffing on your question. We can we can certainly talk more. Um, Zim, your question is a terrific one and a really tough one to answer. So I, I'm afraid I don't have a good answer for two reasons. One, with respect to the sorting of nationalism by party, you need long, longitudinal data to answer the question. And we don't have a single, to my knowledge, single good longitudinal survey of nationalist beliefs, although I'm working on one right this week. Uh, it'll only have two waves, though. Um, so I'm re-interviewing 600 people from this 2016 survey and asking them a whole battery of questions, including ones that are about nationalism. So um, we know a few things. We know that partisan identity is part of deep political socialization and people do not shed that identity lightly. We also know that cultural attitudinal change is slow typically and generational. It works through cohort replacement, not just changing one's mind. There have been exceptions to that. Um, gay rights is an important exception to that. Uh, there have been a number of others, but for most part, these deep kind of identity um, uh, laden uh, beliefs are slow to change. Um, so that leaves the question, what's happening, right? So this is clearly, this is too rapid to be just demographic change. So is it that the parties are shedding people who are weakly affiliated and their party switching? Are they becoming independents or are some partisan changing their minds? One argument for the latter scenario, partisans changing their minds, although it's it's hard to think about national conceptions changing fundamentally, but it's possible. It's sort of the, the tradition of work by Aiken and Bartels and others where parties really set the agenda in terms of identity formation. People don't really care about policies. They have other things to do with their lives and to read policy briefs. Um, and so they're voting on their identities. And as the two parties in the US have become much more coherent and, uh, and much more um, um, with hi higher kind of uh, belief constraint, people have very clear cues about 
how to be a Republican and how to be a Democrat. And that often involves conceptions of race, conceptions of nationhood as well. So if I were to bet, I would say that it's probably a mix of both. I think the parties have a lot of power in shaping beliefs. And so therefore, there may be some people who are kind of wavering around their beliefs about America and kind of switched into one cluster of nationalist beliefs over another. I think that's certainly possible. And I do think there is some churn between the parties in terms of membership as well. Um, certainly around race and ethnicity. So, you know, there's been a lot of uh, shedding of, of African-American, Latino American uh, Republicans in the last while. Um, but, but, but I don't have a conclusive answer to that. The other way to, to answer the question is also like, you know, what are the sources of polarization and sorting in general? And there's a whole literature on this that's still not entirely conclusive, but, they, but there are a number of, 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 of potential causes that have the name because this is not just nationalism showing that nationalist beliefs are sorted is sort of my contribution, but but there is a lot of work showing that people have become sorted on, along all kinds of issues across the two parties. So, um, so you know, Dalia Baldessari and, 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 and um, Andrew Gelman have a paper on this, as do a bunch of other people. And there's some really terrific work trying to explain why this is happening, having to do with the structure of the parties, with greater party discipline, with gerrymandering, with, you know, money and politics, there are a bunch of hypotheses that are put out there. Um, so uh, a longer discussion about that. Um, but, and I think that, you know, those causes that people identify might, might play a role in the, in the patterns I've uh, described as well. So that's kind of a long non-answer to your very difficult question, but an important one. Uh, thanks, Bart. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Um, we've got a bunch of questions, so I, I don't know how we're going to quite get through it all. Um, perhaps if people can be fairly uh, succinct in kind of stating, I'll do the stating, same. stating what it is um, exactly they want to ask. But, um, it seems to me that Margareta, Vanessa and Mariana uh, are all interested in more or less the same thing. Uh, which is around sort of conspiracy theories uh, and the spread of disinformation and how that exacerbates political cleavages. Would one of you like to ask a direct question in that or, or can we just open that up as a general comment for, for Bart to uh, respond to? I, yeah, I wonder whether um, any of my <laughs> previous friends, <clears throat> sorry, colleagues would like to ask um, because I specifically wanted to, um, to ask the question whether Bart thinks that actually something changed in those moments when he actually showed that, oh, on this particular scale, at this particular moment, whether it was 2000 or mid of 2000, some events actually happened. And that's why all those graphics started going different ways because mm -hmm. apparently something happened there. And I was thinking that probably because of the race of the social networks, of all this influence from different media that actually started changing people's minds. Thank you. So I guess that's Thank an you, interconnected yeah. question about, you know, what, what sort of circumstances exacerbated some of those cleavages over time uh, and also the role then of, of social media and disinformation in, in sort of the political landscape in the US. Yeah, I think I can answer that. And I can also, uh, uh, the question about gender from Myla, I think is an important one. And then I'll try to tackle Ben's. Um, so I'll try to be quick. So on the social media, we all have that intuition. It's unthinkable that social media haven't played some role in this. The trouble is the social science on this is really tough uh, to execute well. And so far, most research shows that the effects are not as big and not as extensive as we would think. But of course, you know, we'd have to think, well, what are they talking about? So the, a lot of the, the studies that I'm talking about that have been kind of um, more conservative in their claims have been saying that the echo chamber effect that we all sort of assume is happening is actually, for most part, not really as prominent as we think. That is, people's media diets are much more diverse than we think, uh, and they're more critical consumers of those media diets than we tend to assume. Uh, and they also, most people don't think and talk about politics nonstop like we do. Um, and so the evidence for social media radically transforming political culture is, uh, I would say, pretty thin at this point. But I think we're gonna learn more, and we're already learning more about this, and there certainly have been some studies uh, that have taken advantage of some pretty uh, 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 sophisticated methods to show that, yes, there, where Fox News rolled out, you know, kind of randomly across the country, there was some marginal increase in vote for radical Republican politicians. Um, there is, Brandon Nyhan has shown some, some moderate effects of, of exposure to particular kinds of uh, social media messages, but it's, but the effects tend to be small and, and, and sort of fly in the face of the of broad claims about social media being the cause. So my takeaway from this is it's still early in the social science of this. And I'm for now kind of 
on the fence about it. I think it must have played it must have played some role, but I'm not sure it's the entire answer. Um, you know, there are other things that happened in the early 2000s. There were, you know, um, in the U.S., obviously 9/11 was important was an important moment, um, and there were similar um, uh, national security crises, or it depends how you define it, for some crimes, for other terrorist attacks in other countries, which um, really heightened the, a sense of sort of national identification among many. And actually, what you saw in those graphs is Democrats became much more exclusionary in that time, too. There was a rally around the flag effect, around uh, the, the executive, around Bush, uh, and kind of a, a growing sense of exclusion. Democrats eventually bounced back to the baseline. Republicans never did. Um, and so I think a lot of the structural cultural changes I was talking about are sort of coincide temporally with these trends. A lot of demographic changes, the kind of fears around um, terrorism, which then again are conflated with the, with immigration in very problematic ways, and, and as well as a number of the other things I mentioned. You know, one could go further back, right? End of the Cold War, end of the kind of the bipolar uh, geopolitical system. You know, I, I, that's that's sort of going pretty far. Um, but but there is certainly a lot of transformation happening in the early 90s, or sorry, late 90s, early 2000s. In Eastern Europe, you also have kind of a uh, fatigue with democratic politics, disappoint politics, you know, politics of disappointment after the 90s, which is which is uh, another cause. But I think the point here is, look, there was no Obama in the other countries that uh, have been supporting radical right um, parties. There was no Smalling's catastrophe like in Poland and other countries. You know, there was no 9-11 in a number of the countries that that where this is important. And that's why I think we need a multi-causal explanation because not all of these factors are present everywhere, but a sense of collective status threat, I would argue, among white majorities is present in most of these places or dominant majorities. It doesn't have to be white, right? So in India, it's a Hindu majority. Um, so I think I think that's why I, what I want to point to is a broad explanatory framework with a lot of case-specific variations. On, the, um, on gender, uh, really important question, uh, one that I don't have a, a, a great answer to right away, but I will say that the gender gap in U.S. voting is interesting because everybody thought that it would be the saving grace of, the, of Clinton in 2016, and it was not. Uh, white women voted for Trump in large numbers, which was an interesting thing to, to sort of puzzle through, and people have studied that. Um, there's another way which gender plays a role, and that is kind of the messaging of a lot of these politicians. The, 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 the male political leaders often portray this kind of very particular style of masculinity and kind of a, a harsh father figure. And as we know, many of them have are sort of have all kinds of moral uh, shortcomings that they've very least on this front. Um, and so there is this kind of way in which there is a, a um, a kind of a, a, a um, misogynistic component to the nationalism, which is nostalgic, right? Like America is going to hell in a handbasket. Let's dial back time, go back to the 50s when everyone knew their place. And that everyone includes racial, ethnic minority groups, religious minority groups, but also men and women, right? Um, and so I think there, that, that plays a role in a lot of these politics, certainly in Eastern Europe, the, the kind of cultural conservatism is fundamentally important around, um, around gender, but also around LGBTQ issues and so forth. Um, in Western Europe, it's turned on its head in interesting ways. That's another, another thing to talk about. Um, but there is also this, the fact that the radical right has been trying to, to, to kind of um, uh, polish up its gender image by having female candidates run more often, right? So you see this with Le Pen, obviously. Uh, you see there's a number of uh, day. You saw, you've seen it in other countries where there's a sense that there's a way of presenting the same claims in a slightly gentler way. And when I say gentler, I mean not as obviously misogynistic. And there's a sense of, well, maybe if we put a, a, a woman who, uh, as a main candidate, we can get broader support and not just go after the, the, the male supporters. And you've seen that actually work. And so um, the, the support for radical right parties in a lot of countries have become much more balanced actually across gender um, categories. And so that's in a nutshell, we can talk about that much more. Um, Ben's two questions. Uh, Great questions. Um, so do nationalist cleavages only fuel the right or also the left? Um, so in principle, populism is obviously not only a right-wing phenomenon, as we all know. It can be found on the left and the right. Uh, Latin Americanists have been writing about this for a long time, but others as well. Authoritarianism is certainly found on the left and the right as well. Um, nationalism, the particular types of nationalism I'm talking about, uh, that is this ardent and restrictive nationalism have been most commonly found on on the right uh, among right wing parties and right wing party supporters at least in recent history but it doesn't mean that the left is completely immune from that form of politics if you think about labor union history that a lot of it was very much about sort of white workers versus immigrants right um so so 
and, and, the, and you know, as I showed you in the Clinton versus Sanders example, Clinton's choice to use an affirmative kind of nationalism, even though it was inclusive, but it was a nationalist nationalism versus Sanders kind of uh, uh, kind of reluctance to engage in nationalism, anything other than economic nationalism, maybe, um, did result in a in a in a kind of a, an alignment of certain types of nationalist voters with Clinton versus Sanders. So, so on the left, center left, there are certain kind of ways of using or not using nationalism, and of course, we also know that in places like Denmark. The center left has and, and center right have has mimicked the radical right in its use of nationalism. So it's complicated. Um, it's also the case that the radical right in Western Europe and Northern Europe, I have a paper on this with Christina Simonsen, has used civic, and you've written about this then, right? Has used civic nationalism um, to say, well, you know, you care about women's rights, you care about uh, um, um, uh, gay rights. You should vote for the party that excludes Muslims because Muslims' values are fundamentally opposed to our progressive values. So there's a way in which the right then turns nationalism on its head and uses civic nationalism, inclusive nationalism for exclusionary ends. Um, so it's complicated. But there is, I think, a bigger problem, and that is the problem with the use of the term left and right. Right? If we assume a singular political spectrum, as soon as a party starts being exclusionary and ethno-nationalism, that makes them right by definition in, in that conception. So it's Polish, uh, the Polish Peace Party, right? The uh, Law and Justice Party. Are they left or are they right? Well, they're culturally conservative, but they're kind of redistributive in their economic policies and they're vehemently ethno-nationalist in their views. So we called them as right because they're ethno-nationalist and they're con culturally conservative. But of course, we really need a, at least a, a, you know, a, a two-dimensional um, uh, 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 way of thinking about political variation. And I think and this kind of gets back to the problem that radical right is a problematic term because it assumes one continuum. Um, okay, now the, the, your second question, Ben, about what to make of the call for renewed progressive nationalism. I'm going to leave Yasha Monk out of this um, and Galston for that matter, but I'm going to I'm, uh, I'm going to bring somebody who's closer to me, although I like both of those uh, gentlemen very very well as well. Uh, but Noam Gidron, with whom I've co-authored uh, work in the past, was a grad student in the government department at Harvard uh, and uh, a collaborator of mine. He's now um, uh, uh, a professor in Israel. Um, he wrote an article for Vox based on my work, actually at some point, which is very nice of him, where he said, "Look, Democrats, you've got to play the game." Right, like, and this was long before uh, Monk and Galston jumped on this. Um, and he said, "You've got to, you've got to match them with an inclusive nationalism. If you don't, you're gonna, you're gonna lose the nationalism, you know, competition and and and, and lose elections." And I totally, you know, I, I, I have enormous respect for Noam's work and his thinking about this stuff. So I, I found that our, our argument certainly intriguing, and I think it makes sense. And Obama did this, right? For example, in the U.S., he he did put forth an inclusive nationalism where he could go. Um, talk to you know white workers in the Midwest and say I represent you, and you could also talk to African American uh, supporters and say I represent you because we're all Americans. And he did fashion this kind of inclusive liberal nationalism, and it worked for him really well, actually. So there is, I think, there is um, potential for that. And in some, and Clinton tried it and failed, although failed, won the popular vote, whatever. <laughs> However, you define failure and success in U.S. politics. Um, but it didn't didn't fly as well as it did for Obama, um, and so I'm I'm in favor of that in some ways. But I worry that if Democrats or left parties start playing that game, it's going to maintain the high salience of nationalist uh, arguments, national claims, and nationalist beliefs in politics. And so it's a dangerous game to play, because if you're going to say no, uh, the nation is this, then the other side is going to say no, 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 the nation is something else, and it's just going to keep going. And I would much prefer, I think, normatively to say, let's let's maybe tone down all of that stuff and talk about economic justice, you know, quality, whatever it might be, maybe in some th wrapped up in some thin nationalism that anyone can get behind. But it's so, you know, so uh, broad that it's almost meaningless, as often is in American politics and has been. Uh, I think that may be uh, that sort of avoids some of those dangers. The question is, is that potent enough as an electoral strategy? Um, so it's an open question, I think. Thank you very much, Bart. I, um, I'm gonna use my power as chair to uh, ask the question that I figured everybody would ask, but no one's asked yet. What's gonna happen um, oh, in, in like four days from now? Um, and what can we expect? Um, you know, what's the feeling on the ground there? Being a, a real life American, uh, we have unprecedented <laughs> access, um, although I know you're not originally from America. 
um, if you can just tell us, you know, what 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 you think and what we can expect as a kind of fallout and and what the threats are on the short term horizon. Whoever comes. I've to lived what? here longer than anywhere else now, so I sort of I, I fully buy the full fledged American part. Um, though I don't know if I can channel the psyche of the entire nation, but I, you know. Um, this is where I, my, I sort of have a hard time being a social scientist and become more of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, of a warrior, uh, worry and it's sort of filled with anxiety because I also, if you asked me this question a week before the 2016 election, I would have told you we're going to be fine. Um, and of course we weren't. So look, the data are pointing in the direction of a Biden win. And, and this is and the data look very different than they did in 2016 for a whole variety of reasons. The polls are much better, uh, both in terms of the quality. Also, it's at the state level, it's, it seems to be the case that that the Biden is likely to win. But of course, a, a, a victory is only a partial, partial solution to the current problem. The question is how big a victory, right? Because it's it's absolutely certain that Trump is going to question the legitimacy of the election. And unfortunately, the Supreme Court has been completely compromised. So not just with uh, with the with the um, uh, appointment of uh, Amy uh, Barrett, but also, um, you know, Kavanaugh was selected the Supreme Court for a reason. And just yesterday, he made good on the on that reason. He issued a, an absolutely flawed legal ruling that basically said ballots that appear that are that arrive after election day, even if they're postmarked earlier, cannot be counted. Um, with a radical, basically radical um, uh, judgment on this uh, in terms of its justification. Uh, and that's what he was appointed for. Uh, and Barrett is appointed for the same reason. So we now have a Supreme Court that Republicans are not even hiding the fact that the court is there in order to resolve this election if it's close. And so that's a real, real danger um, that ele the election is close, that somehow it goes to the Supreme Court and then things get dicey. Um, but even if it doesn't go to the Supreme Court, and even if Biden is the de facto winner, it's we'll see what happens, right? I mean, there's going to be possibly some unrest. There's certainly going to be a lot of um, uh, encouragement of unrest and violence from the Trump camp. Um, and we'll, you know, so I think that the period between next week and January is going to be quite fraught. Um, and then there's the bigger, the longer term trajectory, right? So even if all goes well. Let's, let's, I, I know that's sort of a normative statement, but let's say American democracy survives next Tuesday and uh, and Biden wins the election and Trump goes away at least temporarily. You know, first of all, he's not really going away. He's going to be um, he's going to be around. He's going to be fomenting all kinds of uh, uh, nationalist uh, views and authoritarian kind of uh, uh, and popular uh, uh, beliefs. But but there is the question again of what the Republican Party is going to do. Is it going to is it going to double down on Trumpism or not or not? And the trouble is that the, both parties have become, uh, not among the voters, but among um, elected uh, officials have become more extreme, but it hasn't been symmetrical. So the right has been going far to the right, partly because of the influence of the Tea Party. So the Republicans that are in Congress today are not the same kind of Republicans who were in Congress you know, eight, 12 years ago. Um, and so the likelihood that they're all gonna just say, oh, you know, this was just a terrible mistake. We're actually totally inclusive and we should bring Latinos into the fold and not do the kind of faux outreach that Trump does to African-Americans, but actually meaningful change. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't bet on that happening, in which case this form of politics is gonna continue in one form or another. Um, so I think that leaves an important job for Democrats, especially if they capture the Senate as well as the presidency. If they have unified control of Congress and the presidency, that may not last long. Um, so I think that there are a number of, of really important social issues to deal with, healthcare, um, uh, you know, law enforcement reform, uh, racial justice, uh, environmental reform, a whole bunch of stuff. But there's also the, the crucial job of, of, of ensuring that a Trump doesn't happen again, or if a Trump happens, he can't do the damage that, that he, would, he or she would like to do. And so the first thing is safeguarding the integrity of elections. It's, I mean, it's preposterous that in the United States, one party is systematically trying to disenfranchise voters. And has been doing that for a long time through African-American voters, minority voters in general, and, and former felons. But it's now doing it, I mean, quite unabashedly across the board. They want fewer votes counted because more votes is bad for them. So safeguarding the integrity of elections, um, preventing the routine reliance on um, on acting appointments. Almost the entire American government and the entire U.S. executive is running on on, um, on acting appointments without confer actual confirmed secretaries um, and uh, and other bureaucratic leaders. Um, reforming presidential pardon powers. 
which are have been used entirely self-servingly um, by the current president, mandating financial disclosures, tax uh, tax disclosures, um, and broadening ethics regulations and their enforcement. I mean, these are like you know fundamental steps to take in order to shore up American democratic institutions, which are really badly hurting. It turned out a lot of the things that people thought were laws were just norms. And all it took was somebody to say, yeah, I don't care about those norms, violate them with impunity and nobody can do anything. And that I think one lesson of the radical right across countries is that in many, many cases, they come to power through legal means and they maintain power through legal means by changing constitutions. You know, Kim Shepley has done ter terrific work on this other stuff too. There's a formula, there's steps, you know, Orban did this partly influenced by Erdogan uh, and, and Kaczynski did it influenced by Orban. You know, take over the media, especially the state run media, but also influence the private media by withholding advertisements uh, by state corporations and, and other state entities uh, or go after regulation of, of media. Go after the courts, especially uh, constitutional tribunals and Supreme Courts, and then um, and then pass to so pack the courts and then pass through a, a constitutional amendment that guarantee that you're going to be in power in perpetuity. Um, and so the danger is really from within, not from without for all of these um, uh, liberal democracies. Bart, thank you very much. Uh, we've kept you for a good hour and a half now, and it has been uh, a real pleasure for us uh, to have you. It's been very rich in detail and very stimulating. Um, we wish you all the best, best next week from here in Australia, and we hope it goes well, whatever uh, comes to pass in the election. And um, thank you very much for your time. Those of you who can turn on your camera and give Bart a bit of a wave and a, and a thank you and a clap. And um, and we'll, we'll keep Thank in you. touch. Thanks so much, Bart. Thank you. Thanks and so much. Thanks uh, and I took a screenshot of the chat because there are a lot of great pointers and questions in the chat too. Thank you for those. Sorry I didn't get to them. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Bart. Thanks, Bart. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everyone. Have a good weekend. Thank Thank much appreciate it. Thanks.